why doesn't chicken taste like grandma's used to? Once upon a time, chicken actually tastes like chicken. It was savory, it had a butteriness. We went straight to the farm to find out. So the question then, of course, is how do we end up with today's chicken? We cut through the clutter in our Food Truth series. Let's talk about the health ramifications of this. The facts about what you're really eating and where it comes from. Coming up next. We'll save lives today. You guys ready to get healthy? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, did you hear? Did you hear? They recently added the word "hangry" to the dictionary. It describes that feeling of being so hungry you're angry. Who guessed that? A lot of hangriers out there. Some very honest people, thank you for that. We'll talk about that a little bit. Well, the word hangry got me thinking about food and our emotional relationship with it. Nowadays, we overprocess what we eat. We overindulge in it, and then we come to resent it. Too often, we're filling up and being left empty all at the same time. So today, we're building a healthier relationship with food so you can use it to nourish both your body and your soul. So here's what's coming up on the show. First off, we're gonna start with grandma's chicken. I'm talking about chicken soup, fried chicken, all the good stuff. We finally remember it. But why doesn't chicken taste like it used to? In our Food Truth series, we're taking you all the way to an Indiana chicken farm to find out. And in our Truth Tube, we have a plan for everyone out there who eats their feelings. Is guess what? It does not have to be a bad thing. And we're building a better relationship with food by giving you the foods that can help you break your bad mood. Y'all ready for this? Yeah. Oh. All right, so let's get started with our new Food Truth series because you have the right to ask questions and know exactly what you're putting in your body. So I've asked one of my core team experts, award-winning journalist and author of The Dorito Effect, Mark Chasker, to go on the road to find out the truth about what we're really eating, starting with the question, why doesn't chicken taste like it used to? Chicken these days doesn't taste the way it used to. The question is why? What happened to chicken? Why does it taste so bland? To find out, I headed to a 200-acre farm in Indiana run by my friend, Pete Eshelman. How you doing? Good to see you. Yeah. Great. Okay, Pete, tell me, why doesn't chicken taste the way it used to? When I buy chicken, it is the blandest meat. It tastes like wet paper towel. <laughs> what, what's going on? Simply, chickens are not raised like this. They're out uh, all natural, on grass, eating bugs. They're harvested around 14, 16 weeks versus six weeks. That's the difference. So you're, you're saying, the fact that these chickens live outside on pasture eating the stuff and they grow more slowly, that makes them taste better. Absolutely. So if most chickens today don't live on farms like Pete's, where do they live? I set off to find a modern day chicken farm. There's one, but it looks more like a factory than it does a farm. And something tells me it's not open for tours. Inside, there may be as many as 25,000 birds and they spend their entire lives not doing much of anything other than eating. But just what are they eating? To find out, I'm gonna check out this local feed store. Tell me, what's in modern day chicken feed? Basically, you got corn for your calories here, soybean meal for protein, and then the vitamins and trace mineral mix. So would you say then that this food is designed to make chickens grow big and fast? Basically, the, the diet is always designed, I would say, for chickens to grow faster. You've heard the expression, you are what you eat? What about chickens? Well, there's some debate on this, but certain scientific studies show that the flavor of chicken is influenced by what chickens eat. And if chickens grow up never eating bugs or grass and only ever eating bland feed made from corn and soybeans, that's how the chickens taste, bland. I had one more stop to make to find out why chicken these days tastes so boring. Greg. Hi, Mark. Greg Let's Gunthorpe runs a chicken processing plant that supplies some of Chicago's best chefs. So Greg, if I think chicken tastes like tap water, it's not my imagination. It's not your imagination at all. Most commercial chicken is soaked in bleach water for about 90 minutes in a large automated chiller. And how does that affect the flavor? Uh, washes out a lot of the flavor. To maintain flavor, Greg avoids water. Instead, he air chills his chickens inside this refrigerator. These chickens, when they cool like this in a fridge, 
they taste better. They taste less watery, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah they're, you know, the you can wash some of the flavor out by chilling them right. in water. It would be like taking a ham sandwich and dunking it in water. Right, exactly. Yeah. All this talk of bland chicken was making me hungry for the real thing. So I decided to go back to Pete's farm to see what a slow-growing, pasture-raised, air-chilled chicken actually tastes like. The moment of truth. Try my chicken. Oh my god. It actually tastes like chicken. The Mars Jardy has that chicken looked absolutely delicious. So what did grandma's chicken taste like? Um, it tastes more like chicken. I know that sounds odd, so let me put it this way. It was savory, it had a deep savoriness, it had a butteriness. It tasted like it was cooked with herbs, even though it wasn't. Yeah. Well, we say everything tastes like chicken, but this is what real chicken should yeah, taste like. Yeah, once upon a time, chicken actually tastes like chicken. <laughs> All right, so I'm a little stunned by the size issues. Let's get to that. When I go shopping at you know, these wholesale clubs, they have big chickens that I usually buy. Yet you argue that's not the whole story. Yeah, let's look at these two chickens because they tell us a lot about what has happened to chicken. This is the chicken we saw in Indiana, the pastured, slow-growing chicken, the one that was out there in the fields eating the bugs, eating the grass. This is a chicken you'd find at a supermarket, maybe a restaurant. You can see how we've changed the chicken. But here's the most interesting thing. This chicken took 14 weeks to raise. This one only took six weeks to raise, and it's 50% bigger. It's a baby. Uh, researchers say if a human baby grew as fast as, as a modern chicken, at two months it would weigh 660 pounds. 660 pounds? Big baby. Yeah, and that's what we're eating. This is like a couch potato chicken. Look, it's all splayed out there. It's flattened, it deserves a beer here in its wing. That's a big difference. So the question then, of course, is how do we end up with today's chicken? How did it all happen? So come on back, let's tell this little story. So let's go back a few generations. Likely, chicken would be living on a small farm here in a rural area. Chicken would take a long time to grow, as you mentioned, maybe 14 weeks or who knows, in that range. And it was much smaller. It was about three pounds, three pounds, itty bitty little thing. And here's the big story, everybody. Chicken wasn't something you ate all the time. Chicken was a very special occasion product. You'd only celebrate with chicken. So what happened to change all this? Very simply, World War II. Red meat was being rationed, it was being sent to GIs overseas, and the folks back home started eating a lot more chicken. This was great news for the chicken industry, but they said, what's gonna happen when the war ends? How are we gonna keep people eating chicken? So a big supermarket commissioned the Chicken of Tomorrow contest, and farmers all over the country competed to see who could grow the fastest growing they really chicken. They that Chicken of Tomorrow contest? It was contest? called the Chicken of Tomorrow contest. There was a Chicken of Tomorrow queen. There was. There was. Is that related to today's chickens? Uh, indirectly, absolutely. The, the chicken that won that contest grew about two weeks faster. It was plump, two weeks faster than all the other chickens, and a light bulb went off. The chicken industry realized we can breed chickens to grow faster, and they haven't stopped. It was at about 12 weeks in 1948. By the 1970s, chickens were at about eight and a half weeks. This opened the door to fast food chicken. Buckets of chicken, chicken strips, chicken nuggets. It hasn't stopped. Chicken is our number one protein. It's cheap, it's abundant. We eat 30 billion pounds of it a year. It's a lot of chicken. A lot of chicken. All from those innovations 50 yeah. years ago. So let's talk about the health ramifications of this. Does it make a big difference if it's a pasture chickens you were showing us, or, or you know, the, these heritage chickens, I guess, which are descendants from the original ones, or the modern day big baby yes. ones? You are what you eat, and the same is true with chickens. There's a lot of omega-3s in grass. We know omega-3s are healthy, but here's what's really interesting. When a chicken eats those omega-3s in grass, those are simple omega-3s. The chicken converts them to complex omega-3s. You've probably heard of it, DHA. This is the fatty acid we're told to eat salmon and mackerel to get. Well, you can get them in chicken. We could be getting that in our number one meat. I never knew that. It would change everything if we could actually get these healthy omega-3s that our brain needs from things like chicken, which are relatively abundant. So I thought it was only fair to reach out to the National Chicken Council for their reaction. Here's what they said in part, and it's very rational. It says, whether it is traditional chicken, organic, or free range, consumers have the ability to choose products that take into account many factors, including taste preference, personal values, and affordability. The ability to perceive a flavor difference doesn't imply one is better than the other. Uh, they are right. 
By the way, the full statement on DrOz.com, it's up to you. It is about choice in this country. You have the choice, and we're showing you different options. So I've got a million more questions about these heritage and pasture chickens and all the other ones you might be talking about, like organic. So we're going to get going to find out where you can find these healthy versions and everything else you want to know about these chickens that's coming up next. Later, ever skip a meal and become bad-tempered? He starts harassing the waitress. Yeah, I'm really not a nice person when I'm really hungry. What's really going on in your body when your hunger turns to anger? This is what Hangry is all about. Coming up. It's the biggest food fight of the year. GMO labeling. And it's about to get messy. All new Oz. We reveal what's being done in Congress right now. The vote that may deny your right to know what's in your food. Plus... You demanded your favorite companies drop GMOs, and some did. We'll tell you what it means for you. We cut through the clutter in our Food Truth series. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. So if we had a time machine and we could visit Indiana 50 or 60 years ago, we'd see chickens being raised more like this. Uh, everybody had chickens in their backyard and they're just around the backyard, pecking around, eating bugs, eating grass, and uh, they harvest them when they're ready. So this is, this is interesting to me, because I think when most people think of chicken, they think of a farm like this, but what you're saying is that's not true. Very picturesque. We're talking about building a healthy relationship with food and going deeper to find out the truth in the foods that we eat. We started with chicken today, and I want to hear what you're all thinking about today's chicken information. Who likes cooking chicken a lot? Hands up, yours. So here, I'll start with you. So what, what, when you try to cook your chicken, is it a frequent endeavor, by the way? Yeah, I have two girls, so uh, they're big fans of chicken, chicken nuggets. So I just don't know when I cook it or when I go to the store to buy it, really. I mean, we probably eat it three or four times a week in our house. Do the labels help you at all, or is it... No, because, I mean, I always try and buy organic and hormone-free, but I just also don't know which brands are better, which brands are worse, or... Yeah. Chick whole chicken breasts or the whole chicken. I, so I'm a little confused when I'm buying it. So the big question that I'm hearing everyone talk about is now what do I do? Now that I know there's actually differences that I never expected, how do I act? So the chicken you buy actually matters. So Mark's gonna walk us through exactly what to look for. And Darlene's gonna join us up on stage. She says her family loves chicken and she brought in the chicken she usually shops for. <laughs> well, what you bring us? Got brought you chicken breast. Um, Sometimes I wonder about the labeling. I'm not quite sure exactly. It seems a little vague and misleading. There's a lot of information. I just want to know what is important and what matters and maybe what doesn't matter. So maybe. So what does this one say on it that's confusing to you? We got uh, well, this 15, what is that, 15? 15% like the, there's a chicken broth. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Is it, why, why is there chicken broth injected back into a naturally raw chicken? And add like, natural flavorings. I see that all the time and it does beg the question, if it's natural chicken, why do I have to add natural flavorings back to it? It's, it's absolutely, we're in the realm of weird here. Why <laughs> would you soak chicken and chicken broth and add flavorings to it? Um, imagine if you had to soak an apple in apple juice and apple flavorings to get it to taste like an apple. <laughs> well, the reason they're doing this... It's a lot settling, isn't it? <laughs> you don't really want to do that. The reason they're doing that is because chicken is so bland and they're doing anything they can to give it flavor. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is it doesn't work. You can, you can only get a little bit of flavor back in that way. You cannot make it like that chicken we saw in Indiana. But here's what's more important. Blend, you know, chicken is a choice, but blandness matters because think of all the things we do to make that bland chicken taste better. I heard some people in the audience saying their kids love chicken nuggets. Yeah. What's a chicken nugget? It's a ground up chicken breast that's breaded and fried. You're taking this apparently healthy meat and you're adding a ton of calories to it. So let's say you decide, okay, I'm gonna roast a chicken. Well, you pu pull out of the oven, it tastes like cardboard. What do you do? You dump barbecue sauce on it. You dump sugar on it. There goes your nutrition. All right, so well, we're understanding a little bit more about the adulteration that takes place. Let's move on to a big topic. You can carry your bag with you. You'll need this later. We brought up er earlier the concept of a heritage chicken and the concept of a pastured chicken. Yes. And the audience members are confused about it. In fact, so am I. So what's the first choice and what do these things actually mean? So my number one choice is a heritage style pastured chicken. That means two things. Heritage means it's slower growing. Pastured means it's lived a significant portion of its life out on farmers' fields, eating the stuff chickens were meant to eat, bugs, grass, seeds. Not all these chickens are organic, but for me, it's even more important to have them outside. These chickens are hard to find, 
They're expensive. They can cost double or more. And you've got to look hard. You can find them online, maybe a specialty butcher shop, the odd supermarket. And darling, you have one more question that I know was coming up a lot with viewers of the show. Well, um, I buy organic chicken for my family. I care what I put in my body. And I'm just, again, I'm just wondering about the labeling of it and um, just the, um, the injection of is, the broth. Is it the right is choice? It, is it the is, right thing for us to do? Because it does right, cost it more. Is, it, costs, it, it costs more. And is, I mean, are there like long-term scientific, scientific results that you know of that uh, a conventional chicken is maybe not as good to eat as an organic chicken? Well, the first thing I would say is let's not worry about food costing a little bit more. This stuff is going in your body. Let's take it seriously. Um, organic is my number two choice because they're still modern, fast-growing chickens raised usually indoors. Uh, but I think it's a vote in the right direction because when you're buying organic, you're paying a little bit more, you're sending a really important message to industry saying, I care about more than just buying the absolute cheapest chicken possible. Mm. And this is important to consider because we've been talking about these heritage pasture chickens, which I just told you are really rare, and everyone's going, well, if they're so rare, what good is it? Well, these organic chickens were really rare 20 years ago. And what changed it? Consumers. We voted with our wallets. We said, I want this. We paid for it. We, every time you buy a chicken like that, you're voting with your dollars. So if we do that now with pastured, heritage-style chickens, think of the change we could make. I think one day you will be able to walk into an average supermarket and buy a truly great chicken. I think of all the ways we have influenced the way we buy things in America, right? We buy kale now. Didn't used to buy kale. Dark chocolate. What have they been talked about you know, five years ago? Now you can go anywhere and find this stuff, and it gets cheaper as you make more of it. So take advantage of this. You can make your next supermarket trip an even easier one with my little chicken cheat sheet. It's on DrOz.com. You'll enjoy it. Take it with you. And up next, we're going to explore the science of hangry. Stay here. Later, some days food makes us feel really good, and other days it's our worst enemy. You eat your feelings, then feel remorse and regret, stop beating yourself up, and build a healthier relationship with food. The plan to embrace emotional eating. Coming up. We have been talking about building a better relationship with food, so let's be real. If you skip a meal, it can make you a little hangry, can't it? We talked about that word. Actually, the dictionary defines hangry as bad-tempered or irritable as a result of hunger. It's actually in the dictionary now. It's the word everyone's talking about and it's today's conversation. So what's really going on inside your body when hunger makes you angry? Someone in this audience wanted to turn in their friend for being hangry. Here's the evidence. Here's the evidence. Oh, ooh. You recognize yourself there, Wanda? Why would she do that to you? <laughs> she's laughing. Huh? Jeannie's she's a, laughing. Because it's funny. It's funny. It's funny. <laughs> Why are you hangry in that picture? Because they take long to bring my food, and I was very hungry after Zumba. <laughs> so, Gigi, hold that mic if you don't mind. So you say that your friend Wanda gets hangry about three times a week. About that. What happens when, this, when it occurs? First, she gets very quiet, and I feel like that's when something's brewing. Like, I can tell that the frustration is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and then she starts harassing the waitress. Yeah. Like, the kids go, are, you, are we there yet? Are we there yet? She's right. like, is my food ready? Is it there yet? Should I come back there and cook it for you? <laughs> you, you? You know what happens. Yeah, I'm really not a nice person when I'm really hungry. So I'm going to explain to you why that happens, because believe it or not, most of us are not nice people. We, some of us hide it more than others. So come on over here. You guys are going to be glucose. You're going to be sugar. Come over. I got little jackets for you. There we are. You, you, you always want to wear it? I want the gloves too. The gloves? <laughs> I, you know, I, I can, I, I get you gloves. I have access to gloves. <laughs> All right, now we've asked two of our audience members to, to help us out here. Look at mom and daughter, thank you very much. And they're doing all the heavy lifting now. Thank you very much. All right, you got it? Come, come over here, come over here. You guys are sugar. Come over here and hold this up together and don't fall on each other. Okay. Wanda, are you well fed or are you hangry already? All right. <laughs> kind of hangry right okay. now, no. Gigi, put your hands, in the put your body into this thing. Good, put your back into it. Okay, now, you are sugar and you're holding up wait, wait, wait. the suitcase. Oh, yeah. no, don't pull too hard, you're really strong. Hard. This suitcase <laughs> is common decency. It is the normal things we try to do when we're in a good mood. And your sugar, and you're lifting sugar way up, and your brain is being fed, so it's really happy. But a couple hours after your last meal, your blood sugar will begin to come down. 
So Juan, let's move you out of the way. Just push you out of the way. Right there. <laughs> now, as you do that, poor Gigi's left alone, and she can't quite hold the blood sugar quite as much. So common decency starts to suffer a tiny bit. You start snapping at people. The brain is dependent on glucose. Now you're sitting at the, at the counter waiting for your food. Your blood sugar is dropping even more, which sends out a fight and flight response. And then what happens? She's like, all that common decency comes tumbling down with your blood sugar. This is what hangry is all about. Now, did you know what it's like to be in poor Wanda's shoes? <laughs> You're picking on your friend like that. So there's actually a tip that I use personally, because when I get hangry in the operating room, because I haven't eaten in a while, it's bad for everybody. So I never travel without nuts in my pocket. So this is a present for me to you. Aww. Thank you. It's the least I could do. Yay. Enjoy. Thanks for being a good sport. Thank Up next, you. for everyone who eats their feelings, the plan to emotionally eat without gaining weight. Stay here. Later, think emotional eating is always bad for you? What if I told you it can actually get you on the road to a healthier relationship with food? Chocolate cake, to me, makes me think of parties and just makes me happy. What to eat for every feeling, coming up. It's the biggest food fight of the year, GMO labeling, and it's about to get messy. We reveal the vote that may deny your right to know what's in your food. All new odds. That's coming up tomorrow. Food makes us feel really good. In other days, it's our worst enemy. How many of you, be honest about this, eat your feelings, then beat yourself up for doing it afterwards? Am I speaking to a lot of you? Oh. Well, you're about to meet a doctor who says the key to building a healthier relationship with food may be to embrace emotional eating. And that's just what Anthea needs. I am emotionally and physically exhausted at the end of my day. As a nurse, I do bring home a lot of stress for my job. When I get into the car, my food cravings, they explode. I start to get hungry. Every mood has a food. So when I'm happy, I like certain things. When I'm sad, certain types of food. When I'm anxious or nervous, there is a food for every emotion. After I've anticipated what I'm gonna eat, I think about it, I order it. I am craving something banana. I get it and I love the way it makes me feel. Oh, this is so good. I definitely have a place that I go for every type of food that I want. I'm in the mood for something sweet. Eating is definitely one of my coping mechanisms. I'm so excited that I can't wait till I get home. I start eating in the car. When I take the first bite, it's, it's relief. It makes me feel, makes me feel good. It makes me feel happy. And sometimes it's all gone before I get to the door. If I don't finish the food before I get to the door, then I usually sit down on the couch, put on my favorite show, and I dig in. I live alone, so when I eat, it's usually by myself. It is calming. It's like a peace. In that split second, everything is okay. And then I feel bad afterwards. My cravings are an emotional roller coaster ride. I'm eating my emotions. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to get off this roller coaster. I don't want to ride it anymore. I love the cheesecake too, by the way. Yeah. So what happens emotionally to you? What do you feel when you're eating all those emotions? Initially, I feel, I feel good. It makes me feel, you know, endorphins are released and you feel good. You, you, it, it tastes good, you feel good. But afterwards you feel I, feel, I feel remorseful. I feel disappointed. You know, it's amazing, you're so good at so many things and yet this one area just sneaks up on you all the time. It does, it's, it's difficult. You're an ICU nurse. Yes. A lot of pressure being an ICU nurse. Yes. How do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you cope with those feelings? So you become desensitized. You, you kind of, um, because if you get, if you, if you put all your emotions into it, then you're not, you're not gonna be able to do your job effectively. So we kind of like, you know, we have to, we have to go through our day and just be desensitized to everything. And then at the end, you know, Laugh now, cry later. Yeah. You know, when you say desensitize, I think what most of us do, and I suspect this is true for you too, is we internalize the yes. discomfort. Uh, we hide it in ourselves. We want to be strong for the people of around course, us. Of course, of course. Women we do this do. all the time. Yes. Please speak to everyone. You know, when we stuff our feelings down uh, in order to spare others, we're actually forced to something important. 
when we get those quiet moments, we have to deal with them. And the snacks that you're speaking to are what we do repeatedly with that over and over and over again. So I wanted to see how true that was for you. So you kept a food journal for us. Yes, I did. So I'm going to put it up in the truth tube. Oh, it's okay? Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. We found that 30% of your calories are eaten when you have real hunger. They're legitimate. Okay. Legitimate. 70% mm -hmm. of your eating, unfortunately, is eaten for your feelings. Mm. Okay. That moves you from sadness to happiness, or maybe you cope with stress, but it's dealing with the emotional issues, okay. not your body's actual needs. Does that surprise you at all when you see that? It does, because I want to eat, you know, as, as for fuel. I want to eat to live, not live to eat. And hearing that 70%, that's a lot for feelings. It's a big number. You know, I, I was uh, with a chef from Morocco mm. for recently, and he was, you know, very passionate about the food he was making. And, you know, he was Muslim, so the, the, the prayers were being announced. Okay. And I said, don't you have to go pray? And he said, when I am preparing food to nourish the soul, we don't have to pray. Mm. So in their culture, that's how important, that's how sacred food was. So when I see you dealing with food issues, with emotional issues together, I realized we, we have an opportunity, but maybe they're not matched up right. So I wanted to help you with someone who is a world expert in this area. Okay. She struggled with emotional eating herself, and she took what she's learned from her experience and started using it in her practice. Please welcome mindful eating expert, Dr. Michelle May. Hi. Dr. May developed a plan to embrace emotional eating, and I want everyone to pay attention to this because it's not just as easy as saying don't do it. Obviously, if that was so simple, a nurse <laughs> <laughs> who's smart enough to save lives would have done it herself. So the first step is to realize everyone eats for emotional reasons at some point, and we have to stop feeling guilty about it. Michelle. That's right. I mean, we are hardwired to have emotional connections to food. You think about when a baby's born and its parents holding them. Mm -hmm. from, from birth, we begin to learn that being fed means being loved. So it doesn't work to say, just don't do that or don't have emotional connections to food. It's normal to have emotional connections to food. It's that guilt that leads to this eat, repent, repeat cycle and closes the door on learning. It's possible to eat food for comfort and still be healthy and emotionally and physically healthy. So we're going to change the mindset on this. When we Talk about food from now on. On this show, we're going to talk about it very differently. Why eating the food you love is actually a good thing. And the rest of the plan to embrace emotional eating when we come back. Coming up next, the plan to stop worrying about eating less and start loving the food you eat. More. And coming up later, the unexpected good mood food you've probably loved since childhood. These are good. Aren't they good? Yeah, they are. Coming up. We are bringing healthy back this season and want you to bring it too. Grab your prescription pad for fun and sign up for free tickets today. You can go to DrOz.com slash tickets and sign up. The key to building a healthy relationship with food may be to embrace emotional eating in order to break free from it. So Dr. May says to change our mindset. We've got to stop worrying about eating less and start loving the food that you eat more. This seems to go in the face of a lot of advice often given to folks who are emotional eaters. Yeah, it's true, but here's the thing. When you make the foods that you love bad, you actually end up putting them up on a pedestal. Yeah. You want them even more, so you think about them, you crave them, and when you eventually give in because of stress, mm -hmm. you eat them and then you feel guilty. And so then guilt becomes another emotional trigger for overeating. That's that eat, repent, repeat cycle. So it becomes this vicious cycle that becomes really hard to break out of. The thing is that all foods can fit into a healthy diet. It's really about learning how to balance eating what you love and loving what you eat, balance eating for nourishment with eating for enjoyment. So, sounds so obvious, but it's hard to do, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Come on over here. We're going to walk you through steps that actually will take you down that path to success. The first little te test is called the four really test. Like four times really. What the heck does that mean? Well, so when you want a macaroon, instead of immediately reaching for it or feeling guilty or, or worrying about paying penance for it, ask yourself, do I really, 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 really want the macaroon? If you really, 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 really want the macaroon and you eat a rice cake, 
Mm. It's going to take a lot of rice cakes to satisfy you, right? Yes. So you're better off having one or two macaroons that you really love and be done with it and not ruin it with guilt. Okay. But you got to ask yourself four times. Really, 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 yeah. really. Okay. No matter how difficult the day was, no matter how much you had, you hid your true pain because whatever may have happened may have been displeasure to you. You've got to still ask those four questions. Okay. okay. Next is to divide our cravings into two buckets, and these two buckets are. So think about your cravings as fuel and emotional needs, okay? So these two different types of cravings that we get are really important, and it's important to be able to, to distinguish the difference. Okay. So if you're hungry or hangry, and you take food, grab any food, and go ahead and put it here into this fuel bucket. Not that you would eat a whole pepper, <laughs> but go ahead, there you go. All right, good, so you're dumping this, maybe you even want a cookie. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. hungry, take so two. You, take two. I have two. Yeah. Put it in your fuel bucket. Okay. Now, when you come home from work and you're stressed out, maybe you're uh, needing a little sweetness, a little pleasure, a little connection, a little comfort, and you begin to eat your favorite foods, go ahead, put them in there. Let's see what happens here. Actually, yep. let's just, break, let's just it break it out. Takes, let's just go with the big boy here. Yeah. Let's go right. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. It is really hard it's really food. good, isn't it? <laughs> See, this is part of the problem, right? We the love problem. the food. <laughs> so here's the thing. It doesn't matter how much you eat or what you eat. You can never fill your emotional needs mm. empty with food. Right. You, you can never, never fill your emotional needs with food. Food is really for meeting your fuel needs, and it can be pleasurable. You can have the cookie or the macaroon or the cheesecake. But it's that, it's not leaving that big hole in that bucket. And finally, you want us to create a new ritual. You have a ritual. You're driving home. You're trying to soothe yourself. You're trying to practice self-care. But you're doing it in a way that's leaving you feeling worse. You said yourself, it leaves I, you unhappy. I feel guilty when you I eat. You feel guilty. When I eat it. And guilt is a powerful trigger for more eating. So instead, when you're driving home and you're really thinking, I want cheesecake, go ahead, pull in and ask yourself, do I really, 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 really want cheesecake? <laughs> okay. Get your favorite kind, but don't eat it in the car. You deserve better than that. Take it home and then sit and eat that cheesecake lovingly, wonderfully, and when you're done, you're done. Okay. When a craving doesn't come from hunger, eating will never satisfy it. So this is about meeting your needs for fuel and meeting your emotional needs better. Okay. They can save patients' lives and yours. Yes, we, yeah, I happen to, we diagnose everyone around us and we don't diagnose ourselves that's and right. that's the problem. And we trust nurses the most, so yes. be a role model for us. Okay. All right. Good luck to you. Thanks, Thank Michelle. You, so much. Very well. you can get the full plan and all the information from our Truth to Make person at DrOz.com. Please make sure to check out Dr. Michelle May's book, Eat What You Love, Love What You Eat. Now that we know it's okay to embrace emotional eating, what should we actually snacking on? What to eat for every feeling when we come back. Later, the surprising good mood food that will lift your spirits. It's the biggest food fight of the year, GMO labeling, and it's about to get messy. We reveal the vote that may deny your right to know what's in your food. All new odds. That's coming up tomorrow. We just learned that sometimes emotional eating can actually put you on the road to a healthy relationship with food. But when the mood strikes, what do you actually eat? Host of Just Jenny on Sirius XM Radio and the twin celebrity Jenny Hutt is here. <laughs> Gonna give you what to eat for every feeling. So you're just watching my little segment on the, the science of hangry. Yes. So what do you do when you get hangry? Well, Dr. Oz, I'm always prepared and I'm gonna, cause you mentioned glucose, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so in my bag at all times, not even kind of kidding. It's a heavy bag. Yeah, so I carry candy, which I think is fine because look, like, these are chocolate covered peanuts. Yeah, they are peanuts. Protein, like, right? In a, in a way, yes. Yeah. And this is a source. What else do you have in there? Oh, I have also peanut butter cups. Also, they have peanut butter, so protein. Oh, my goodness. Oh, those are, those are, they're, they're cherry nibs and they're yummy. <laughs> Let's put this away. Why? Get, What's wrong? They're, they're gonna get the wrong impression from the show. Put that back in there. 
I think there's some water in there. You yes, like Ziplocs, I see. I do like Ziplocs. All right. So you just recently tweeted something out. I'll yes. quote it. said, I just want to eat my feelings. True, yes. So what were you feeling like eating that day? Oh, God, I mean, that. I think I probably had pizza, but I was just, <laughs> it's true. I was just feeling sad, and sometimes to deal with it, I eat. So we made you our role model. We do an intervention on you today. Oh, boy. We asked Jenny <laughs> to text us her mood, wherever yes. she was, and the food she was actually craving over the past few days. And we've got three women up there, unsuspected. Don't start eating yet. <laughs> Why are you eating? I'm supposed to. We haven't even started yet. The segment just began. I'm still so doing my intervention down here. All right. These women also admit to eating their feelings, and they're at our tasting table. They're not supposed to taste yet. They're still eating. <laughs> Please. Maybe they're going to get hanger tubes. No, no, they're, We're no, hangry. They're, they're, you're hangry. <laughs> I gave me it's safer. You're, well, hold on to your hangry. The women behind you, please replace the women in the front, please. <laughs> all right. Let's just start with the first one, which is anxiety, which you probably all feel up there right now. Jenny said that when she gets anxious, yes. she actually likes something crunchy like potato chips. I do, and I think I should have one now. Um, here's why. I think the crunch of the potato chip is like a ritualistic, constant, it stops me from thinking about what's really making me nervous. Okay, I want to satisfy the crunch that you have. I'm going to give you this microwavable sweet potato chips. Okay. You may do the reveal. It's so simple. You just take a sweet potato, slice them up nice and thin like this, put it in the microwave, a little olive oil, about three minutes on each side, and then put a little salt on them, and it looks, oh, like this. So good. There's one for right. you. Only now, one. Okay, wait a minute, taste. wait, wait. Did you really just give me one chip? Yes, one chip. I'm but sorry. But these you can actually go splurge on. Instead of those, yeah, I would those, want like a, all of them. Peanuts yeah. you were having before. Oh, I'll share. Here, here's five, five more for you. No more than that. I, he gave me six chips. What do you guys think? I like. I like them. I like the crunch. So they, good. Are they crunchy enough? Very crunchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deal with your anxiety? It right. works. The same yeah, goes, you might need to scoop something up later on. Next feeling was happiness. Right. You say when you're happy, you eat chocolate cake. Why that connection? So I, chocolate cake to me makes me think of birthdays and parties and dinner and breakfast and just makes me <laughs> happy. I love it. It's cake. <laughs> it's, a, it's good. You like it up there as well? It's really good. Yeah, but you don't know what's it's in there rich. yet. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. No, it's squid it cake. doesn't matter. <laughs> That's squid cake. It is a little dry. <laughs> what but kind it of cake? Good. It's not squid cake. Uh, please. <laughs> All right. Go, go ahead, yeah. serve it up a little I'm bit. Gonna, you know so, what? I'm going to share it, and if you want, I'm going to take this, oh and then gosh. if you want, <laughs> I'm going to let you have a taste of it. It's all I'll need. Yeah. So let me show you how I make my cake. Eat it. I'm going to eat it in a second, but let me teach you how to do it first. All right. So you all buy these box chocolate uh, cakes or box oh. cakes, period, right? Uh -huh. Very simple recipe. Mm -hmm. Three ingredients are usually added, water, oh, oil, and eggs. Is that correct? Yep. Here's what you do. Water, same old water you can use. You're going to replace the eggs with half a banana. Mash up the banana. All right. Want some? Please save it. And then yep. you want to replace the oil with uh, uh, with uh, Greek yogurt. You use probably three quarters of a cup. Jenny's left. Uh, she's uh, at flight risk. She's sure? already left the audience. Well, I think other people might want it. It's really, it's, if so you they want were, more. They're in a good mood down there. So it's delicious. Do you really but like I it? I do. I, I made this myself. You, you really bake this? <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is so good. Isn't it good? Yeah, it's not dry at all. What it's do you guys think? Dry. I said that, but I think it's more moist towards the bottom <laughs> than the top. You have to know how to eat cake. You go to the <laughs> bottom, so it's all the like wet oh, yeah. stuff, and then you just eat it. All right. Yeah. Mm. Now, well the last emotion, which is the most deadly one for food, is when you're feeling blue. And yeah. you said that when you feel blue, you actually crave ice cream. There are a lot of issues being explored here today, yes. Dr. Oz. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think ice cream is the perfect sadness food because I like to take to my bed and then I could just take it with me to my bed. Yeah, but you have to eat it quickly if the ice cream is going to melt. No, but it's not messy. There's no crumbs. So here's what I did. I took your normal pint of ice cream you might make and I have an alternative recipe. It's my avocado chip ice cream. It's straightforward. You take avocado, mash it up, but not quite like guacamole. Right? Then you, that gives you the creamy base banana, yeah. coconut oil, maple syrup, mint extract, and then you want a tiny bit of milk in there, obviously. Right. And then add the chocolate chips right on the top like I did there. The chocolate chips. Now, now you can see what I'm talking about. It's better with the chips. It needs the chocolate chips. It needs yeah. the chocolate It's not chip. bad. Both? You know what? It's not bad. I mean, it, it's not great, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. The it's chocolate bad. cake, however, mm -hmm. is sensational. Mm -hmm. Well, this was frozen. You have to leave it overnight to freeze, and it'll be fantastic. The cake is my specialty, it's but so the ice good. cream you'd like as well. Which is your favorite up there? Definitely the cake. Mm. The, yeah. Mm. The Two. chips are the cake. I'm going to go with the cake. 
All right, we have cakes for the, the winner. Cake. You know what? We're going to put the cake recipe on DrRoz.com. Right. We're going to destroy the other two recipes. You can't have them. Yeah, and I'm going to take this home in my bag with my other snacks. It'll fit perfectly. <laughs> yeah, when we come back to surprising good. good mood food, that will lift your spirits. I'm not kidding. I like I'm this one. I'm going to put this right in a bag. It's the biggest food fight of the year, GMO labeling, and it's about to get messy. All new Oz. We reveal what's being done in Congress right now. The vote that may deny your right to know what's in your food. Plus, you demanded your favorite companies drop GMOs, and some did. We'll tell you what it means for you. We cut through the clutter in our Food Truth series. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. This video I've seen a long time. That a remarkable what you do with pancakes. You know what? They're good for lots of reasons. They're also a good mood food that can lift your spirits. So, who wants to help me with my little surprise with pancakes today? Hands up. Interested? Oh, can we get a couple of help. You start us. If you fail me, I've got my backup team back here. I'm not I'm not, come on over here. What's, you? okay. what's your name? Jasmine. Jasmine. Can and I what, help you? You want to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jasmine. I appreciate it. All right, you got to hold that for me. Okay. All right, childhood memories of foods that just lifted you up. Okay, um, I'm a big sweet eater, so my parents always, they make the best strawberry cheesecake every holiday. It's a tradition every year. It's comforting, it's the best. It's a perfect taste. It's of, the best. It's got a combination of everything. All right, yeah. so there's food that's attached to all of our memories, and it does lift our spirits because it reminds us often of childhood events that were sort of cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna show you a picture of a childhood event that I just took okay. last week. Here it is, this is a picture of my granddaughter Philo. Aww. That is her first meal she ever prepared me. That's her, her blueberry pancake. It's a four parts Aww. blueberries, just a little bit of pancake mix in there. <laughs> it didn't hold together too well, but I did heat it up and we had a good time. So I hope she'll like those when she gets older. But I'm gonna share with you a pancake recipe that everybody okay. can make. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. It's buckwheat flour pancakes. You'll be talking about this tomorrow. Now, despite its name, you know what buckwheat is? No, what is that? But it's a grain-like seed. It's fantastic because it's gluten-free. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks can eat it who can't tolerate regular pancakes. And it has a lot of fiber, much more than regular pancake. And it looks like this. Oh. Now you. Did you make that? Of course, I made everything today. Oh, okay. Chocolate cakes, everything. So how would you dress it up? Show me how you dress it up. Okay. I, I love strawberries, like I, I said. I love strawberries too. I'm only giving you healthy options over there, by the way, okay. except for maybe this. Strawberries and blueberries. Strawberries and blueberries. Raspberries as well. And a little bit of syrup, of course. Yeah. Get a little bit of syrup there. <laughs> now, I want you to bite into this. And this yuck. You, you like walnuts? Me? Please, I love walnuts. You want some? <laughs> What's up? You know, we've got a splurge here. Yeah, put them yeah. on there. All right, but, but you gotta taste the, the pancake okay. and confirm for everyone watching right now okay. whether you think this is a reasonable alternative to okay, regular old pancake. Let's Again, see. we're talking about buckwheat pancakes. Could okay. they work for you? You know, while you're tasting yeah. that, you this taste is, some too. I'm gonna taste some too, but I, I eat this all the time. Okay. I want you to taste this because you were kind enough to volunteer. Mm. What do you These think? These are good. Aren't they good? <laughs> yes, they are. Really? I like that. You agree? Amazing. All right. Go. So, the, day, the, the day is longer. I want you to enjoy all these. You can check out my Pinterest board for the yummiest buckwheat pancake recipe and share it with your friends. Remember, health and happiness starts at home. I'll see you next time. Dig in. Woo!